I'm Laurie Sullivan. I oversee community engagement for KLRU TV, Austin PBS. We're here this evening with our partners, the LBJ Library and Museum, to present a preview screening of the documentary Freedom Riders, a powerful look at the first Freedom Riders in May of 1961 who rode buses through the South to challenge local laws or customs that enforced segregation. After the screening, Mark Updegrove, director of the LBJ Library, will conduct a Q&A with civil rights leader Julian Bond, who's featured in the documentary. This is just one of the activities that KLRU does in the community to extend the dialogue of the content that we present on KLRU. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Uh, on behalf of KLRU, Austin PBS, and the Lyndon Baines Johnson Presidential Library and Museum, let me welcome you here this evening to a very special night. Uh, I'm Bill Stotesbury, the general manager of KLRU, uh, and there are several things that are going to happen this evening that I'll tell you about. Fifty years ago this month, more than 400 black and white Americans risked their lives and many endured savage beatings and imprisonment for simply traveling together on buses and trains as they journeyed through the Deep South. Deliberately violating the Jim Crow laws, the Freedom Riders met with racism and mob violence along the way, sorely testing their belief in nonviolence. Tonight, we'll screen an excerpt from Freedom Riders, a powerful and compelling new documentary from American experience that tells the harrowing and ultimately very inspirational story of six months in 1961 that changed America forever. PBS stations across the country, including KLRU, are privileged to air this remarkable film in the next couple of weeks. Here in Austin, Freedom Riders will air on KLRU on May 16th at 8 p.m. and again on Sunday, May 22nd at 4 p.m. It's a two-hour film and it's well worth your investment of time as well as that of your friends and family. As someone who was a child of the 60s watching this film reminded me of the importance of recognizing history, both to appreciate how far we've come and to make sure we never go back again. And as the father of a teenager, watching it with her gives me an opportunity to reflect on an experience that I hope she never has the opportunity to, to encounter. We're also particularly excited by the fact that a traveling exhibit that is, has been developed by the producers of the film opens here at the Johnson Library on May 9th. The exhibit has been traveling through the United States, but we're particularly happy that on the month that marks the 50th anniversary of the Freedom Riders, the exhibit will be here at the library. The PBS series American Experience has partnered with the Gilder Lehrman Institute of American History to create this exhibit that tells the story of the 1961 Freedom Rides, including extensive multimedia content, in, as well as tracking the current status of many of those who participated on the rides across the country. How fitting that it should open here at the LBJ Library 50 years to the month from the historic journeys. So we'll watch about a 30 minute excerpt from Freedom Riders and then following that screening, we have the opportunity to listen in on a conversation between Mark Updegrove, the director of the LBJ Library and Museum and Julian Bond. And it's my great pleasure to say a few words about Mr. Bond before we begin the film. Wikipedia, which is my source for many things, <laughs> I have to admit, said that Julian Bond, see I'm not alone, am I? Says that Julian Bond is an American social activist and leader in the American civil rights movement, a politician, a professor, and a writer. It didn't say, but it could easily have added that Julian Bond is a true American hero. An American leader in the American Civil Rights Movement, he helped found the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, was the first president of the Southern Poverty Law Center, and was elected to both houses of the Georgia legislature, ultimately serving four terms in the House and six terms in the Senate, before leaving to serve as the chairman of the NAACP from 1998 to 2010. He's been widely honored, but I was fascinated in reading his official biography to learn that in addition to receiving more than two dozen honorary degrees, serving on numerous boards, both corporate and, and nonprofit or educational, he's also widely published, including several books of poetry and a book of his essays. 
In 2002, he received the prestigious National Freedom Award. He's also been named one of America's top 200 leaders by Time Magazine. And in 2008, he was named a living legend by the Library of Congress. And we're extraordinarily privileged to have a living legend here with us this evening to share his personal experiences of this dynamic, difficult, and challenging time in American history. So with that, let's begin the film, watch the film, and then enjoy a conversation between Mark and Mr. Bond. Thank you all very much. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, my friend Bill Stotesbury put his characterization of our, our guest of honor tonight very aptly. Please join me in welcoming a true American hero, Mr. Julian Bond. Okay. Thank you. So right here. Right here. Good. Thank you. We are delighted to have you here and, and honored that you'd be here this evening. I'm honored to be here, and I remember the last time and only other time I was in this room, President Johnson was standing here, Ms. Johnson, speaking to a group of people gathered to see the unveiling of the Civil Rights Papers at the Johnson Library. It's the only time I ever met him, and it's good to be back. Well, we're delighted. I was going to talk about that, and I have a little surprise to show you at okay. the end of the, the program to that end. But, um, this, I think this was a moving experience for all of us watching that film, uh, but you were closer to, to the Freedom Rides than, than all of us. What are your feelings when you, when you watch that film? Well, I met them when they came through Atlanta. They had a dinner, uh, Genevieve uh, Houghton said, a reception. They had a dinner with Dr. King at a black restaurant in Atlanta. Uh, and I didn't go to the dinner, but I met many of them as they stopped in Atlanta overnight. And I, like they, I had no idea of what waited for them. I thought this was dangerous and risky, but I had no idea it was as dangerous, as risky as it could have been, as it turned out to be. Um, so I was fearful for them. I was, thought they were brave people, probably a little foolish, a little naive, not understanding what danger lay ahead, lied ahead for them. Um, but I was proud of them and, and glad to have had this little brush with them. Uh, didn't think I'd ever see any of them ever again. What did, what did you think would happen with the Freedom Rides? I thought they'd be roughed up. They might be beaten up. Um, but, you know, some of them came near death. And uh, at this occasion where, where the film stopped, had uh, that Alabama state trooper not been there with his pistol and fired in the air, I'm sure something awful would have happened. Yeah. Uh, so I, I thought something bad would happen to him, but I didn't think it would be as bad as it turned out to be. What is the significance of the Freedom Rides in the grand scheme of the Civil Rights Movement? This well, was one plank of the Civil Rights it, Movement. It did several things. It, it took this organization, the Congress of Racial Equality, and took it from obscurity and made it almost on a level with the NAACP, with Dr. King's organization, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, my organization, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. It lifted it up. And it put core on the left wing of the civil rights movement with my organization, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, as kind of a counterweight to the relative conservatism of the NAACP and Dr. King's organization. So it, it gave more strength to my side of the fight. It uh, showed that there were people, white and black, but importantly white, who are willing to risk their lives to advance the cause of human freedom. And it just sent a signal, I think, all over the country. And it sent a message to young people, both black and white, that you can do this. The sit-ins had swept the country, or the South anyway, a year before, in 1960. And now here's another movement coming along, a different kind of movement, but also involving young people. And it said to young people, here's something you can do. So it did all those things together. You were 21 years old mm -hmm. uh, when the Freedom Rides occurred. And you had already been involved with the movement for a while. Uh, it was a very heady time. How did you get involved in the movement? 
Well, I've told the story so many times. I was uh, in February of, of 1960. I was going to Morehouse College and I was sitting in a cafe, a place we used to go uh, between classes or instead of classes. And <laughs> an older student at Morehouse College, whom I knew slightly, named Lonnie King, came up to me and held up a newspaper. And the headline said, Greensboro students sit in for third day and described how these students in Greensboro had had a sit-in demonstration for the third day. And he said, have you seen that? And I said, yes, I've seen that. He said, what do you think about it? I think it's pretty good, I, I like it. He said, don't you think it ought to happen here in Atlanta where we are? And before I could say, what do you mean, uh, he, we? <laughs> uh, he had said, you take this side of the cafe, I'll take the other side and we'll call a meeting. And within a couple of minutes, we had gathered a mass of people who said they wanted to do this and over the next several days, we got more and more and more. And in a couple of weeks, we were having sit-ins in Atlanta. We saw Martin Luther King in the, in the film. Uh, and 40 years, over 40 years after his death, we've more or less canonized mm -hmm. Martin Luther King. Uh, but you knew him. Yeah. What was he like? Uh, he taught me, and this story I've told more times than the other story. Uh, I'm one of the few people in the United States who honestly can say I was a student of Dr. King's. There are a lot of people who say that, you know, but they're lying. <laughs> I am the only person who sat in the classroom where Dr. King was the teacher. Only eight people have that experience, and I'm one of the eight. Uh, I took a class at Morehouse College, a uh, survey course in, in philosophy that he co-taught with the man who had taught him philosophy when he had been a Morehouse student, and so I knew him a little better than many people knew him. I, did, I, we, I can't say we were intimate friends or anything like that, but I do remember one day, class was over, and he and I were walking across the beautiful Morehouse College campus, and I said to him, I said, Doc, his friends called him Doc, I said, Doc, how are you doing? And he said, Julian, I'm not doing well. He said, unemployment is high, racism is everywhere, segregation seems to move, but he said, I feel awful, I have a nightmare. I said, no, Doc, don't say that, turn that around, try I have a dream, and well. Now, I have to say quickly, that's not true. I, <laughs> I, I made most of that up. And I've said it so often, I was being introduced someplace and the guy read my biography and he said, and now the man who taught Martin Luther King to say, I have a dream. So. Your secret's safe with us. Okay. Uh, what would Martin Luther King think of our world today? Well, I think there are things about our world that he'd be tremendously pleased about, he'd, he'd love the idea that Barack Obama is president of the United States. I think he'd consider that a validation of the work that he had done and was doing when he died. I think he would be pleased to know that people of color uh, appear in places they didn't dream of in, during his time, and that this is a very different and a better country now than it was when he was alive. I think he'd be dissatisfied at things not done, at gaps not closed, at differences still apparent. He'd, he'd be worried about that, and he'd wonder to himself, why aren't more people doing mo more things to get rid of these problems? Um, I thought I'd started something or carried something forward. Why hasn't it been carried forward even more? So I think, in that sense, he'd be disappointed. The, the, uh, and I'll go back, uh, I'll look forward in a moment. Let me, let me look back to the, to the movement for a moment. And the principles of nonviolence. Uh, I would imagine they would be very hard to subscribe to if you see a violent mob coming to you, not being able to defend yourself. How do you teach yourself to be nonviolent when people want to physically harm you? Well, I think it depends on, or, or during this period, it depended on where you were, where you were in the movement. In Nashville, for example, where John Lewis was in school, they had extensive training in nonviolence how to protect yourself, how to fall over and uh, so your vital organs are protected, uh, how to ensure that your head, your neck, um, your eyes could be protected, um, how to react when somebody's spitting at you, how do you do that? And so the people in Nashville uh, were thought to be the most skilled or schooled in nonviolence. In Atlanta, where I was, uh, we were just told if somebody hits you, don't hit back, okay? Okay, and that was the extent of the training that I had. And luckily, no one ever hit me, uh, so I didn't have to hit back. I didn't even have to think about hitting back. But I did see examples 
you know, at some demonstration, the other, of how effective this thing is. I remember somebody, we were picketing a grocery store in Atlanta, and this white guy came up and hit a guy who was close to me. And the guy he hit just didn't, just stood there, didn't do anything. And I wasn't sure I could have done the same, and lucky nobody ever tested me. But the hitter was just paralyzed. He had expected some response, and not getting it was just, could not do anything else, could not move another inch. Just all of his anger, all of his fight was taken out of him like that. And it showed me how powerful this weapon is. And the surprise to me is that so few people use it today. I think it's used in ways we don't really realize today, uh, on picket lines and protests of one kind or another. But I'm, I'm surprised it's not more widely used because it is so effective. Did you expect to succeed to the degree that you did? I don't know, because you say to the degree that we did, I don't think we knew what the degree we did could be. Right. If you had told me that a black man would be president of the United States, I would tell you what I told you up until the Iowa caucuses. No, it'll never happen. It cannot happen. This guy, Barack Obama, seems like a wonderful guy. I'm sure he'd make a great president, be a wonderful president, but it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't for me, at any rate, until he won in Iowa, until this overwhelmingly white state said he, we think he could be our president, that I thought he had a po real possibility of doing it. Until then, I thought this was not quite a fool's errand, but it was an errand that wouldn't pay off, it wouldn't happen. Um, so, you know, things have happened that I didn't dream would happen by this time, and things that haven't happened that I thought would have happened by this time. So it's kind of a mixed picture. Let's talk about what, what, what hasn't happened that you expected to happen. Well, I thought more attention would be paid, and I, I fault my own organization, the NAACP, as well as all the rest for this, too. We've not paid enough attention to housing segregation. And housing segregation in this country is at the root of so many other kinds of segregation. It depends on where you go to school. It depends on what kind of job you have or what kind of access you have to what kind of job. And if you live in a segregated section of your town, you're not going to have uh, the opportunity to have the finer things in life. That's just a, a fact. Right. And we, and by we, I mean we in the civil rights movement, haven't paid as much attention to this as we should have. We should have done more. We should have pushed harder. Uh, you know it's against the law to segregate housing in the United States. Uh, we don't investigate this. But there are people who do it, but not many, not enough, not, and not as many places. And as a consequence, we still live in a rab rab tremendously segregated world. And that segregation hurts us all. Yeah. Um, Barack Obama's inauguration was clearly an important milestone in the, in the, in the struggle for, for civil rights. Some people thought of that as an end point, in a way, and mm. not a beginning point. Have you been pleased with what you've seen since Barack Obama has become I was president? pleased to hear today, and maybe people here don't know it because I, I arrived here after you did, that the Republicans have said they're not running a candidate in 2012. <laughs> that it's all over. And instead, Obama's going to just be asked if he'll stay on for another four years. Uh, there, there are things he's done I wish he hadn't done. When he apologized for saying that the policeman in Cambridge acted stupidly, I thought he never should have apologized for that because the policeman did act stupidly. He comes across a man who's sitting at, standing on his porch. He has identification that says he lives in that house. And the policemen arrest him. That was stupid. And Obama was right to say it was stupid and wrong to say he apologized for it. Um, he didn't push as hard as I wanted to do for the public option. In fact, we found out that while we thought they were, public option was a, a, a possibility in the health care bill, that a deal had already been made that it would never be part of that. So that's disappointing to find that out. But you know, I'm old enough to have seen many presidents of the United States, and not one of them has done everything I want them to do. And I don't anticipate that one of them is ever going to do what I want them to do. I was a big fan of President Johnson. He did many things I think he shouldn't have done, um, and didn't do things I think he should have done. So you have to take what you can get. And with Obama, I've got a package I'm so happy to have. Yeah. The, there are. The divisions in Washington are uh, as deep as I think they've been in my lifetime. Can we heal that divide, in your view? I don't know. If you have one party that's determined to say no, 
that if the president determined to oppose the president, whatever it is he proposes to do, even if he comes their way more than I think he ought to, even if he holds out a hand and says, I want to work with you, as long as they're determined to say, no, no, we can't heal these divides. And these divides are divides caused by the party of no. If one party says no all of the time, then, I mean, how can you, you can't work, you can't do anything. I served in the Georgia legislature and we had many, many differences. And this was almost a totally all democratic legislature when I was there. It's almost all Republican today, but it was almost all democratic then. And we had divisions and they were typically urban, suburban, and rural. And many, many differences among us. Many people thought this and I thought that and they thought something else, but never anything like this. We learned how to get along with each other. And for most part, we did get along with each other. I live in Washington and I saw them up, see the Congress up close. And it's just so heartbreaking to see no, 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 no. It's everything, that's all the Republicans know how to say. And apparently all they know how to do. And as long as that's true, we're gonna have this awful divided government. So what's at the root of that acrimony? I think some of it is, is enmity against Obama because of his race. And I'm not saying the Republican Party is a racist party. Uh, <laughs> but I think there's a little portion, portion of, the, of the opposition to him is, 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 a, is because he's black. And the idea of being president while black is just, some people just cannot take that. They cannot absorb that. They cannot understand that. I think there's some honest disagreement that he's doing this and they think he want to do that. And that, you know, that's to be expected in politics. I think there's the feeling that if they say no to everything, they'll get something. And maybe they will, I hope they don't, but maybe they will get something, but it just seems to me the wrong way to go about it. We, we, you and I talked about the, the birther mm. controversy earlier today. Were you, were you pleased that, that Obama had released his birth certificate? Do you think he should have done it earlier? What was your, what's your view on that? Well, I don't know if people in the audience watched uh, Chris Matthews the other day. He ran a series of things about what Obama had done in the days leading up to the announcement that bin Laden had been killed. He went to Alabama to commiserate with the victims of the tornado damage. He went to Florida in the expectation he'd participate in the uh, moonshot or whatever it was. He uh, went to the correspondence dinner and was funny as he could possibly yeah. be and he really got it to don put Donald Trump like that. <laughs> and, and he, all the time, he knew that we had identified the possibility that bin Laden was in this house and that he had made the hard decision not to drop a bomb on the house, which would have taken care of it, but to send American troops in there who risked their lives to see who was in there and risk their lives in finding out who it was. Um, and I just thought, gee, I wonder what he was thinking when he stood up there at that podium at the correspondence dinner, looked out at Donald Trump and thought to himself, I got something for you, Donald. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know. I, I, on the one hand, you know, on the one hand, I'm glad he put out his long form birth certificate. But I thought, you know, if people can't believe that the other birth certificate was good, why would they believe this is good? And of course, some of them don't believe it's good. We've already heard people say this is a forgery, that's not real, that his father's name is, his race, father's race is listed as African, so it's not valid. Come on. And some people will never believe anything about, anything you say about Obama, and there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. We look at this film, and it's easy to say that great injustices were done 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. There's the old saw that it's easier to build a monument that it is uh, a, a movement. When we look back at this age, 50 years from today, what will we feel the great injustices were of this era? Of this period? Of this period, Of yeah. this period. Well, I'll tell you, I, I have other thoughts first. I see so many people in this film that I know, or I knew at a time, so many of them have passed away. Um, I don't know if you saw James Peck 
and you probably couldn't identify James Peck, but James Peck is the guy who took over leadership of the Freedom Rides after James Farmer's father died, and he had to come back to Washington to do it. And James Peck is an interesting guy because he's the only person who went on the 1947 Journey of Reconciliation that was the first Freedom Ride, and also on the 1961 Freedom Ride. And he should be someone dear to the hearts of many of the women here, because think of that name, Peck. His family owned Peck and Peck. So he was a multi, came from a multimillionaire background, and yet he engaged in this kind of activity. And he's typical of the kind of person who went on this trip, people who didn't have to go, who didn't need to go, but who, like Peck, decided, I'm gonna throw my lot in with these people. Um, the wrongs done are just enormous, both the physical damage done when people, and later in the film you see beatings and uh, you know, almost near death here in this bus, that, that bus had blown up in a different kind of way, they all would have been killed inside, uh, or killed standing next to it. Um, the, the wrong, real wrong was just that there had been two Supreme Court decisions leading up to this, the Irene Morgan case that was talked about in the film, and a case involving a guy named Bruce Boynton from Selma, who had, uh, was a Howard University law student and who was arrested in Richmond for sitting in the front of the bus. Two Supreme Court decisions that said black people can sit anywhere in the bus they want to sit, and yet all these states refused to obey it. That was the real wrong, the real wrong, and that wrong is banished and gone, and it took these people to make it go away. The Supreme Court couldn't do it, the Congress couldn't do it or wouldn't do it. These people did it, and that's how it happened. Yeah. There are many who talk about immigration as the new civil rights. Mm -hmm. What is your view on, on immigration? Well, I'm all for immigration, but you know, people say something is the new civil rights every day. Yeah. Uh, it's upsetting to me, this is the new civil rights. This is the new, you know, we can't have all these new civil rights, I don't think. I think immigration is an important issue, and you know, we were close to, to, to getting to, to the bottom of it and close to getting to solutions to it. And there was the beginning of some bipartisan feeling about it when 9-11 happened. And somehow that just colored the whole debate and shifted it in the wrong direction. And it's never been able to recover from that. But I can remember talking to people both in organized labor, um, including those who had been opposed to a more liberal immigration plan, who thought that the infusion of these immigrants hurt organized working people uh, and who really changed their position, changed their ideas. Uh, there are people in the Republican Party who had, like John McCain, who had a good position on immigration, but of course has changed completely, uh, backed away from what he used to believe in. Uh, so you can't be helpful, hopeful that something good is gonna happen with this issue because it's so important, but you'd hope that cooler heads will prevail, but I don't know, I'm not optimistic about it. What are the steps that we should be taking toward a more productive and healthy immigration policy? Well, you've got to have, the most important thing is a path to citizenship. If you're in immigration, you're living here in the United States, an immigrant, and you're living here in the United States, how do you become a citizen? If you're here illegally, how do you become a citizen? Is the fact that you're here illegally a permanent bar barrier to your never becoming a citizen? If, is there a way around that, a way you can overcome that? We've got, this is a thorny, thorny problem. I'm, I don't have the solution, but there's got to be a solution to it because you have this enormous population of people, 13 million, who are Ill, not, illegally here, and you cannot push them all out and take them to Mexico and uh, the border and say, hey, go away. You, it just can't be done. You have gotta find some way to do it, and I don't know what it is, but that's the, that's the root of the problem. You've been a very outspoken proponent of, of gay rights. What, in your view, should be done on that front? Well, I think the people who have a religiously based opposition to gay rights, or to gay people is what it really comes down to, yeah. uh, have to find out that, you know, this is, you know, I think 13 states have now legislation proposing to eliminate the possibility of Sharia law in the United States you know, Muslim law in the United States. But then when I see people saying that their religion tells them that two people who love each other cannot get married, that's kind of a Sharia-like thing to me. So we've already got this kind of law encroaching on, on our, our public. Um, and we can't have religiously-based prejudices deciding what our laws will be. We can't have religiously-based ignorance and religiously-based prejudice decide what we, what, how we can behave and how we can behave toward each other. So I think, Religious people, you know, if you, you feel that you don't want two men to marry in your church, that's okay with me. It's really not okay with me, but that's, you know, it's okay. 
But you can't say they can't get married at City Hall. I don't think, or you shouldn't be allowed to say so. And what has happened is that religious people, or some religious people, have said they can't get married in their church, and they can't get married in City Hall either. And I don't think we ought to let religion make that decision. Yeah. Talk about your feelings uh, about the Middle East and the uprisings that we've seen there. When you see uh, citizens rising up against their governments uh, in the face of oppression. Are you optimistic that real reform can come in that Oh, I am tremendously, I'm an optimist anyway, uh, against all evidence. I, I, believe, <laughs> I believe good things can happen. And I, I know from my own life experience that good things have happened. Uh, when other people said no, I said yes, and they did happen. Um, and one thing that I think many people don't know about the, what we've all going to call the Arab Spring now, is earlier last year, well, in 1956, I think, a group called the Fellowship of Reconciliation put out a comic book based on the Montgomery bus boycott. It was a regular comic book, you know, with colored pictures and people and doing this. And it told the story of the Montgomery bus boycott, told the story of Martin Luther King and the use of nonviolence in the Montgomery bus boycott through the eyes of a working class man, black man in Montgomery. And someone translated that comic book into Arabic and distributed hundreds of thousands of copies of it around Egypt. And there's a body of opinion that believes that comic book played a tremendous role in fueling what happened in Egypt to our great surprise, our great you know, understanding, how could this happen? And I have to admit, I, I wondered to myself, how could this happen? You know, this is the last thing I expected to happen, but not only in Egypt and every other, not every other, but many other countries, and it's still going on. And in Egypt where they've, not won what they thought they had won. They're still continuing to press on, and I think they're gonna to continue to press and press and press until they get at least a semblance of what it was they were fighting for. And that'll be true in these other countries too. No matter how great the repression, no matter how great the oppression, they're, they're gonna keep at it, and I'm, I'm just tickled to death that they're doing it, and uh, wish we could be more helpful to them than we are. I, I look at what's happening in Libya. I'm not sure what else the United States can do uh, without stepping on across borders and boundaries that we shouldn't step on. But I wish there was something more we could do to help them. Yeah. Uh, you've seen things in your, in your career that uh, most of us could not possibly imagine. Has there been a high point? Oh, there have been a lot of high points. Uh, when these uh, civil rights bills passed, the 64 uh, Civil Rights Act, the 65 Voting Rights Act, um, when the Voting Rights Act was extended time and time again. And of course, the Voting Rights Act is under threat right now. The new senator from Kentucky has said that the Civil Rights Acts were wrongly decided. This man is in the Senate of the United States. And you can't believe that any sane person thinks that way, but apparently he does, which must mean. <laughs> anyway, that, and, and so, you know, these, these rights are never secure, but when these bills passed, and, and I was never present for the passage, but watched from afar, it was just a validation of work I had done and other people have done. And you know, and I see my old friend John Lewis in this video and think what a hero this guy is. You know, what a, a strong, courageous man this guy is. Uh, and, and there are hundreds like him. You know, I was lucky enough to get back to my hotel room today in time to see the Oprah Winfrey show which I have to tell you, I don't watch every day. She had over 200 Freedom Riders on her show and drawing largely on this documentary, told the story of the Freedom Riders, but drew from them things that didn't come out in this, at least in the portion of, of, of I saw. Um, and I wish, I hope you could find some way to go back and capture that program and see it again. And also, don't make sure you see this. When is it gonna be shown? Oh, later PBS? this month, yeah. Later this month, watch your newspaper for time and channel on the local PBS station and send them some money too because they need it badly. You know, they're under attack. Um, uh, you talked about the Civil Rights Symposium in this yeah. very auditorium. I think we have a visual. Can I can we see that visual? <laughs> hmm. Well, let's start with the hair. Those are the big hair days. 
<laughs> and uh, frankly, I wish they'd come back. <laughs> <laughs> well, you wore you were it well. Uh, and and you, you talked about some of the things that, that uh, were celebrated in, in this very room at that time, the 64 Civil Rights Act, the 65 Voting Rights Act. Uh, and, and you talked a little bit about your memories of that time. But talk about that, that experience. Well, this is sort of a who's who of the Civil Rights Movement was in this room. And we saw a picture upstairs. Vernon Jordan is over here. In, in the picture, LBJ and Ms. Johnson are, are standing here looking out at this crowd, and Vernon Jordan is standing over here, and I looked back in the crowd and I saw another couple of people I, I knew. I looked for myself, but I couldn't find myself. And then out of nowhere, down this aisle or that aisle, came Roy Ennis, the guy who had taken over the Congress of Racial Equality and turned what had been a respectable integrationist organization into a right-wing black nationalist organization and changed it almost like this, um, made it into something very different than it had been. Uh, and he came down this aisle railing at President Johnson, who was standing here by himself at this time. And I can't even remember what he was talking about uh, because it seemed like gibberish to me. And uh, railing and railing at President Johnson. And I was amazed. I thought Secret Service men would jump up, and, but they didn't do that. And President Johnson handled him so well. And I, as I say, I was a big fan of President Johnson. I opposed him on the war. I thought he was so wrong in that. But in everything else, he was so good. I think in civil rights, he was the best president we've ever had and are likely to have. And uh, he's, he was just a wonderful guy. And I was just so impressed with the way he handled Roy Ennis and sort of, in effect, said, sit down and shut up. But he didn't say that. Uh, Maybe it's too genteel to say that. Well, one of the <laughs> yeah, a lot of people think that uh, LBJ was uh, very genteel. That, that's, he, he gets that all the time. The best story I heard about President Johnson was that somebody asked him, how did you feel when you met the great World War II hero, Charles de Gaulle? Weren't you thrilled when you met him? Johnson said, I had my hand up his leg in five minutes. <laughs> One of the things that you saw at the end of the Civil Rights Symposium in 1972 was that there was a fragmentation of, of black groups, mm -hmm. uh, which was happening, happening increasingly during the late 60s and early 70s, particularly in the wake of, of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, is there a unified voice in the African-American community today? Well, as unified as it's ever been on some things, there's unanimity in black America that racial discrimination is wrong and, and that we need to do all we can to eliminate it. And we need to depend on our, our federal government as well as our state and local governments to do everything they can to make sure that it is eliminated and it goes away. There's unanimity about that. Uh, the division uh, is really, I don't think as great as it seems. There's always been different views. If you take the civil rights movement alone, take the NAACP, the uh, Congress of Race Equality, which really can't be considered a civil rights group anymore. The National Urban League, so let's say the NAACP, the Urban League, Dr. King's organization, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee has gone away. So among these three organizations, uh, there's fair unanimity about what they should do, what their program should be, and they don't always agree on solutions, but they all agree on causes. They all agree on what the problem is, and they all agree that something has to be done about it. So the divisions aren't as great. Now in black America, generally speaking, um, if you think about politics, there's almost unanimity among black Americans in terms of their politics. Most are Democrats, and they aren't Democrats because the Democrats are so great. They're Democrats because the Republicans are so bad. <laughs> and when you have a choice between something bad and something that's okay, you're gonna choose the okay every time. Uh, so, I don't think there's as much division as, as you may uh, think. I think there's a higher degree of unanimity. There's never been absolute unanimity with everybody agreeing in the same way, but most people believe, let's go this way, let's try these things, and most people do that. Yeah. I must tell our audience, uh, Mr. Bond and I uh, share an alma mater. We both went to the same high school in Newtown, Pennsylvania, outside of Philadelphia. and. Uh, we went there a few years apart, but I grew up uh, hearing all about 
Julian Bond, and, and he's a great hero of mine. And I can tell you, this has been a great honor for me and a great honor for this library. Thank you so much for being here today. Well, thank you. And thank you all.